Just look at her now, Molly. Isn't she the sweetest thing you ever saw? I didn't answer. Instead, I sat quietly on the doorstep, my elbows on my knees and my shoulders, hunched sulkenly up to my ears. I didn't budge or speak. Before my gloomy eyes was the kitchen yard, a gray and gray expanse with never a tree or bush to shade it except for a lilac hedge framing on the garden side and one sickly peach tree growing at the corner of the house. Three hens and one rooster were scratching about the flat stone at the kitchen door. It suited my humor to sit in a scanty strip of shadow cast by the eaves, my feet upon the step that had soaked in the noonday sun, and to be just as wretched as a five-year-old that I could make myself. The room behind me was my mother's, the master bedroom of her home. A big four-poster, hung with dimity curtains, stood in the farther corner. The dimity valance was trimmed like the curtains, with ball fringe, and it hid the trundle bed that was pulled out at night for Mary Liza and me to sleep in. At the foot of the bed was my baby brother's cradle, where Mary Liza was putting her doll baby to sleep. We said doll baby back in those days. And then there was Nanny, my rag baby, who was a beauty when she was new. Oh, she wasn't old now, but fate had been unkind to her. Twice I'd left her outside all night. The first time was when I laid her at the foot of a particularly tall corn stalk. I told her that I would return presently, but I couldn't find her at all when I went back. I was up and out early the next morning when I finally found her, but it made my heart bleed. Since a field mouse who had six acres of roasting ears of corn to choose from, but he made suffer on the brand that served as my poor Annie's brains, nettling a hole in the exact region of a cranium. My mother plugged up the hole with raw cotton and stitched up the wound, and the dear patient was doing better than could have been expected. But then there was a thunderstorm, and Annie was on a bench outside. The rain lasted all night, and I couldn't go out to get her. One immediate and obvious consequence of this adventure was that there was nothing left of Annie's features, except for her eyebrows, which were laying on with indelible wink instead of watercolors. There she hung, head downward, on the front of the kitchen fire for twelve hours before she was thoroughly dry. My mama did the best she could to draw eyes, nose, and a mouth with an ink pen, but the effect was pathetic and mournful at best. While I sat in the door that evening, putting on Annie's nightgown, I overheard my Aunt Sally say to Mama, You ought to buy that child a sure enough doll, baby. It breaks my heart to see how much she plays with that poor wreck of a rag thing she's got there. My mother's reply was so low that I didn't catch it. But the tone of her voice wasn't promising. I didn't say anything to her or to anybody else. But, of course, Annie and I talked it over. I assured her that she was going to have a beautiful sister who would love her and play with her and tell her stories of the wonderful city and how happy all three of us would be together. Next day, Mo and Paul went away to Beckley, West Virginia, and they took the baby with them while Mary Liza and me were sent to Aunt Sally's house to stay until they returned. When my aunt took us back home, she told my mother, right before my face, that I'd been as good as gold. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, Mama replied when she gave me a kiss. I was afraid she was going to be troublesome. She isn't as steady as Mary Liza, you know. Oh, and by the way, I have something for both of you girls in the trunk of my car. She always spoke of us in that way, although Mary Liza was actually her niece. An orphan, she was seven years old, and the most spoiled child in the county. Pretty, too. Fair skin and shiny braids of golden hair, and innocent blue eyes, and gimpled arms, and fluffy, kidnish ways. While there I was, as lean as a snake, and brown as a chinkapin, and as wild as a hawk. Truth be told, I was used to hearing myself being compared to all three. Mary Liza could read a New Testament, but I'd stop in a spell word at only three years old, and she could write in a copy book by the time she was five, and do math on a slate at six. By the time she was seven, she was as much company to my mother as if she had been seventeen. In a word, my cousin was perfect, while I was often called a plague. 
And yet, I can honestly confirm that I had never known until this black day when Aunt Sally brought me back home what it meant to be envious. Now, I wasn't exactly fond of my cousin, yet we seldom disagreed openly. She wore clean frocks and liked to stay inside and piece bed quilts and knit stockings and read aloud to my mother. Me, I never willingly spent an hour in the house when I could meet outside, and I had odd ways in my home that I kept secret for Mary Laza because I was sure she'd be shocked or laugh at him. And anyways, my parents had arrived back home late at night, and the trunk was unpacked with much ceremony the next morning. Under my mother's best new dresses that she had bought was a long pasteboard box that she opened, smiling at our expectant faces. From it, she drew the biggest, prettiest doll baby that we had ever seen in a blue silk frock with a sash to match. She even had real hair, curly and black as coal, with round black eyes and a cherry ripe mouth. I reached out both hands, and a cry of rapture rushed from my heart to my lips, an inarticulate gurgle of unbridled happiness. Yet, Mama couldn't see my gesture, and I hoped she didn't hear the cry I let out as she laid the new doll baby in Mary Liza's arms. For me, there was a book with only a few pictures and lots of tiny words to read. Now, I'm not hoping this might coax you to learn how to read like Mary Liza. I tell you, it makes me ashamed to say that my little girl doesn't know her letters yet. Oh, and here you are. Your pa brought you a Noah's Ark. I received the book, Emmy Ark, without a word, and I marched towards the door, my heart ready to break. My mother quickly bought my path to the door. What do you have to say about your presence, Molly? I had stirred shell shock, my eyes on the floor as Mama quietly took the painted door from my hand. When you can say thank you and stop pouting, you can have it back. I dashed from inside of the house and ran down the steps to hide underneath the porch. It was high enough for me to stand upright underneath it, and the sides were screened with climbing sweetbriar. I often hid here and played Daniel and a lion's den, where I was assisted by my imaginary friends. They were the lions, and I was always the persecuted. The fury of forty wild beasts was in my heart as I pushed aside the prickly branches and I crept into my lair. A den was paved with bricks, loosely laid. I picked up a stick and I prowled up one of the bricks and I scooped out dirt with my hands, digging a grave deep enough to hold the April book that Mama had just gave me. I thrust it in without the benefit of clergy and I pushed the earth back on it, burying it forever before I pounded a brick on top of his shallow grave. Paul found me underneath the porch at thinner time, fast asleep. He carried me back in, and he washed me and gave me clean clothes, and then he scolded me for my unladylike ways and warned me of his solemn intention to tell my mother on me the next time such a disgraceful thing happened. I didn't mind the lecture, though. Paul seemed to know me, and I knew him, and I believe to this day that he was a better parent than my mother who bore me. And that night at supper, we had lots of guests. Me and Mary Liza sat next to each other, and Mamba pulled out an extra chair to the table, just with Mary Liza's new doll baby, which Mary Liza frequently interrupted her eating, just to caress her or to rearrange her curls or her skirts, while my own mother smiled affectionately. Me, I couldn't even taste the food on my plate. I wondered dully all the sight of the doll baby and the fuss her owner made over her. It turned me sick. As soon as I could get away, I slipped down and out the side door to find my Annie. There was a sudden new bond of union between us. She had no beautiful sister, and I had no beautiful daughter. I hugged her hard, and I cried a little over her in a brief, stormy way, and those tears hurt me. But they did me ease the hot ache in my chest with a lump in my throat. At this juncture, when my misery was at its height, I heard Mary Liza from behind me cooing and hushing her baby doll with tones and words that she had copied faithfully from my mother's talk over my brother's cradle. Wouldn't you like to rock her for a little while? She asked. I wouldn't mind if you'd promise not to touch her. Sometimes your hands are dirty, you know. I shed my jaws, savagely gown on my lips, biting my tongue, not moving or looking up. Just then, I felt her standing close to me. Annie had dropped from my lap and laid face downward on the step. 
Mary Lassa picked her up and brushed off the dust from a pathetic, expressionless face. Poor thing, she purred. I hope nothing will ever happen to my Rosella like this. Isn't that a lovely name? I made it out of my head from Rosa and Zilla, two lovely girls that I read about in a book. Well, I think it's a nasty name, was my immediate response. Mary Liza recoiled with a fine horror, which stung me like a needle. Oh, Molly, what a word for a little lady to use. I looked up at her for the first time, my eyes burning in dry sockets. I think your doll is nasty, and Rosilla is a stupid name, so there. Mary Liza looked up shocked and terrified. She glanced right and left and upward nervously, just as if she was fearing the punishment of heaven would fall upon me at any moment. Then she turned to leave. She had only gone a dozen steps when she looked over her shoulder to say, in her most grown-up and judicial manner, I hope you won't make any noise tonight and wake Rosilla up. She's going to bed now. I rose and went straight to the cradle as soon as I knew Mary Liza was out of sight. A cold, deadly fury possessed and filled me casting out all fear of consequences for my parents. I plucked Rosilla from her bed, and I threw her into the air, cuffing her polished red cheeks soundly on the way. Then I stripped off her dress and knotted the ribbon sash around her smooth neck. I had never tired a knot in my life, but this one held, and so did the loop that I threw over the branch as a sickly peach sapling in the yard. There she was, naked and forlorn. Rosilla dangled a foot or more above the ground and I went and I fetched my Paul's riding whip from the table in the house, and at last feeble check upon my fury was released as I swanned over and over towards the doll. <laughs> the next thing I knew, a pair of cool, white arms closed in around me and the whip together. It was my Aunt Sally's voice, half laughing, half horrified, as she cried into my ears, Molly, what's gotten into you? All at once, red mist parted and rolled away from my eyes, and I became conscious again. And in that moment, I saw that Mary Liza was jumping up and down and screaming, and that everyone else from the house was there on the spot. My father, my mother, the entire dinner company. All eyes were focused on me, and what was left of Rosella. The lash had drawn cell dust at every blow. One arm and both legs were torn off, and the stuffing was scattered beneath. A crop of black curls was tangled in the topmost limb with a sapling, and the blue silk gown would never fit what was left of her waist again. Rosilla was beyond the possibility of reconstruction. After the Rosella episode, I was grounded for the entire summer, and Mama promptly went and bought Mary Liza, a new doll baby. For the next few days, I wasn't allowed to eat at the table with the rest of the family, and I was made to eat alone on the porch, even when company was over. One day, we had a large group of folks over, and my cousin Maggie Bale saw me out there alone and decided to sneak me away for a walk. Now, this particular household of folks was so little to Cousin Maggie's liking that she got away as soon as lunch was over, taking me, a willing captive, with her. Furthermore, she had stolen Bud, my baby brother, from the floor of the kitchen, where he was playing as the adults were cleaning the kitchen. Bud chuckled and crowed and squealed, as if he were the heart and the head in the front of the joke, while we scampered down the middle garden walk, hidden by the tall azalea bushes, and made it to the rail fence at the lower end without being spotted. Maggie Bell made me climb over first, and she lowered Bud carefully into my arms before she leaned her weight upon the two hands laid at the top rail and whirled over the fence like an acrobat. Nick, she could outrun half the boys and outjump them too. The ground was given abruptly below the garden and to a level stretch of the old field where the broom straw came up to my horn gets, their yellowing laves parting before and closing behind with a surge and a swish of a gentle surf. They smelled sweet, and they felt soft, as Maggie Bell let Bud down from her shoulders, making a hammock with her arms, and swung him back and forth through the pilot's stands, as he choked with ecstasy. Beyond the old field was the old orchard. The new orchard was planted nearer to the house. 
and was in full bearing, and Paul made little account of such fruit from the old orchard, mostly choke pears and apples from the unpruned trees that were enterprising enough to grow and ripen without timbing or harvesting. The trunks of the trees were shrouded with knobs, and the branches were such that it made climbing the easiest sort of work and swinging on them an irresistible temptation. Up in the higher branches, there were coney forks. One could sit, read, and even sleep without the danger of falling. Me and my troop of imaginary friends had sped one the whole July Saturday in and under this big tree. When the apples were beginning to ripe, I was Elijah, and my imaginary friends were the ravens, who piled me with all the sweets until I couldn't have swallowed another one to save the combined kingdoms of Judah and Israel. I was sick all night after the feast, but I bore no grudge for my misplaced confidence in the human stomach. Presently, we three runaways were camped down underneath the broading branches. The untrimmed turf was as thick and dry as a parlor carpet. Bud crawled lawlessly about, picking up twigs and pebbles and testing his first four teeth on him. But he was a good baby, never swallowing anything that he couldn't bite into. His real name was William Skipworth Butterwell. Uncle Lewis had named him Rosebud during the first moon of his existence. And the abbreviation was inevitable, just like that. He would probably remain Bud for the rest of his days. Maggie Bell threw herself down at full length on the grass and pillowed her bright head upon her arms and stared contently up into the apple tree. That's more like it, she breathed. I'd sat down beside her, my short legs tucked underneath me like a wild child. That was one of the things I liked about being outside, especially with my cousin. I could sit cross leg because if I forgot my manners like that at the house, my ma would pull my legs straight out in front of me and pop me with a stick, reminded me that I was going to be a young lady one day, like it or not. I had always looked up to Maggie Bell. She was feisty and independent. Her eyes were full of laughter and laziness, and the color in her cheeks was that of velvet perpetual rose, shading into peach and then into pure white that never took on freckles or a tan from the hottest sun. Her hair was auburn and curled like great tendrils from the nape of her neck to her forehead. In the shade, it looked like a perfectly grown bay horse, and when the sun struck it, it got all alive, as if there were light under it as well as over it, and it was unmistakably red. She made more fun of it than anybody else, but at heart she loved her hair, and she wouldn't have exchanged it for any painted gold or ebony tresses. A thick curl strayed over her arm, bare almost to her shoulder, as was the warm weather custom of ladies in that time. She drew it around before her eyes, thinning it into its silky veil, holding it up high, letting it slip, strand by strand, between her and the light. I sure love being out here with you, Maggie Bell. I'd much rather be out here than in the house, talking to all of them. I tell you, I'm tired of them all, especially Mary Liza. I feel like I'm a prisoner in that house. But in that moment, as I was about to open my heart, I jumped and gave a little squeak. Maggie Bell! There's a praying mantis on you. He had tumbled out of the apple tree upon the folds of her skirt, and, before I could capture him, a second one fell on her. I was up and on my feet in a twinkling, and I seized the first one, and then the other, and held them up between my fingers as they were kicking and sprawling. Oh, I knew the tricks and the ways of the praying mantis, because when they weren't foraging or fighting, they would sit upon their hind quarters and fold their legs as if they were praying. I'd caught dozens of them and fed them for days in a box that I kept hidden in my bedroom. I had coarse lace tied over the top to prevent escape, and there I studied their habits, and I would even humor myself by putting several of them together in their little prison that became an arena. Mama would find my secret box and release them in the yard before scolding me. What's wrong with you, Molly? Why can't you be normal like Mary Liza? Presently, I held them by their backs so they couldn't bite me, while they pointed their wicked heads, almost turning completely around with their savage effort to avenge their capture. I was sure that these two had been fighting up in the tree. That's why they both fell so close together on Navi Bell's dress. Have you ever seen them fight? I asked curiously. If I were to let them go this minute, they'd begin the fight instead of running away. I tilted my head sideways, studying their faces. Suppose we try them now. That's a great idea, Maggie Bill said as she sprang into action. 
and built an improvised cockpit, a sprayed in her pocket handkerchief, upon the ground, where I've released the gladiators. Instantly, they more than justified my account of their ferocity by grappling, each rising to his full height and hurling himself at his opponent's throat. You see, they're more than acquainted with one another. I commented. I was the official umpire, manager, and promoter of the fighters. You see, Maggie Bell, they're just picking up where they left off up in that tree. Oh, it was an exciting display. Maggie Bell raised herself up on her elbows, and me, I moved closer and spread my hands flat on the grass to lean in over the arena. I peeked through a small magnifying glass that I had in my pocket as the two warriors fought with unbridled hatred for one another. Each weary advance and recoil from the first encounter, they would circle about at close quarters, each watching for its antagonist's weak point. Then, the sudden clutch, embrace, and wrestle, which I, as the umpire, interrupted over and over again to prolong the combat. At length, I left the combatants to follow the bent in native savagery. They bit venomously below the belt. They grabbed at and hung on to any part of the body that came him handy. They rolled over and over, intertwined so closely as if to appear like one convulsed devil monster. Finally, one of them gave a violent kick and went still. In that moment, the victor shook himself free of the carcass, and we saw the head that he had bitten off from the other's neck roll from underneath the survivor. He walked an inch or two away from the remains, and he sat up on his hind quarters, folding his legs, and sanctimoniously reciting the battle prayer. After his devotions ended, he proceeded to lick his wounds and exit the arena. When my fig station ended, I lowered my magnifying glass and I found Maggie Bell staring at me in disbelief at the joy that was written on my face. Molly, I don't ever want to see a fight like that again. That just creeped me out. Well, I think it's interesting. It's not like they have souls anyway. They just die and they don't go anywhere, I replied. Just then, a disagreeable noise joined Bud's cooing and babbling and made both of us turn quickly, right before us, within six feet of the helpless baby who had sat up to regard the phenomenon. With innocent wonder was an enormous sow with a brood of hungry young ones at her heels. Her vicious grunt and glowing eyes and dripping jaws with projecting tusks bespoke of her danger. Only yesterday I had seen her prowling in the barnyard when she seized and devoured one after another three small ducklings before the stable boy could beat her off. In the terror of this moment, that scene flashed back to me, and I could still hear the crunching of those savage jaws. Quickly, Maggie Bell swooped down upon Bud and had him up on her shoulder before I could spring him out like a silver trumpet. The wild beast halted and made as if though she would turn, but then she gave us an angry, squealing grunt and lunged towards us. There wasn't a loose stick or stone anywhere within reach, and even if there had been, there wasn't any time to pick it up. Run for the fence! Run! Maggie Bell bravely called out as she met the voracious brute with a kick so well lamed that the high heel of her shoe struck full upon the eye of the sow. During the respite that was gained by the sow's staggering recoil, Maggie Bell caught my hand and we fled along the path traced in the trampled broom straw. which through we had waited merrily just a while ago, but we had only gone a dozen steps when the heart of the enemy was roaring behind us. I ran with all my might, thinking she would eat me and Bud, just the way she ate those ducks. I bet she'll eat me first, I thought, and I knew she meant it, and I knew it was true. The fence was no more than 50 yards away, but it looked to be a mile off, and the wild grass was tough and treacherous as it had been pliant and sweet when we had first danced through it. Now, I was a swift runner, and my limbs obeyed me well. However, I was conscious of a strong pull of Maggie Bell's hand that lent wings to my feet every other step as she pulled. If I were to stumble, she wouldn't let me fall. Yet, the sow would have caught us had it not been for one of her pigs, who let out a squeal as it lost its way and got entangled by the grass. The mother went back to reassure it with a series of staccato grunts 
very unlike those she gave to us when she renewed the chase. Finally, we were at the fence and I scrambled over, spent and shaking, and hardly able to catch Bud as he was lowered down to me. Just then, Maggie Bell dropped in after us as our pursuer's snout was poked between the lower rails in a last and futile effort to get at the baby's fat legs. Seeing it, Maggie Bell's face flamed scarlet in a second. There was a pile of pea sticks that laid over in the fence corner. She grabbed one of them and jumped the fence again. Wheeled in her weapon, she brought it down, term and term again upon the ugly head and the raw-blown body when the sow finally turned tail and ran. Just then, the conqueror returned to me. I held Bullet tied my arms, and we both laughed and cried together. We sat down on the grass, and she clasped the baby so close to her heart. He cooed joyously and held up his sweet open mouth for a kiss. Mouth. But he didn't get one, but twenty kisses upon his wet lips and his pink face and curly head. And then Maggie leaned over to give me one so long and tender. It was the first time I could ever remember someone kissing me like they cared. A few days after the apple orchard incident, Miss Bray came to see us, bringing her daughter Lucy. Their home had been in Mercer County, West Virginia, but I had overheard my Paul say that Mr. Bray had a heavy case of Western fever. So when they arrived, I was surprised to see him looking so well and strong and that he had a hearty appetite. It turns out that Western fever, and if they were moving to Ohio, traveling in their own carriage, and also having with them a huge covered wagon, drawn by four firing horses and packed full of furniture. They had planned to spend Sunday with us just to say goodbye and move on by Monday. Yet, by Saturday night, Miss Bray took sick, and before morning, the tiniest baby I'd ever saw was born. It was very weak, too, and cried like a kitten. The mother had to be kept perfectly quiet. The dogs were put up in Pa's shop, and everybody went on tiptoe and talking in whispers. It was all very dreadful to me until Monday morning, when an enchanting change was made in the domestic arrangements. Our house was a typical Appalachian house, with two bedrooms in the main house. I had a small section that was added in the back, provided a temporary makeshift bedroom for when we had company stay overnight. Paul cleared out the back room, and Mama got it broom clean before putting a big mattress on the floor, telling Mary Liza, Lucy, and me that we would have to play and sleep in this room until Miss Bray was well again. The room was the coldest room in the house, so Paul built a small fire in the fireplace. The mattress was a feather bed with some old blankets and pillows. It immediately became our favorite resort. Even Mary Liza entered in on the fun that would let us climb on the pile and sink down so far in that bed. We would pull the blankets over us and make believe that we were on a big covered wagon. Going to Ohio, our dolls and a few other toys went with us, and we munched on ginger cakes and apples, and played like it was at night, and we were about to sleep on the wagon, and that the wind that was howling underneath the heaves outside was wolves rolling around and around the campfire, looking for some little girls to eat. Mary Liza was Mr. Bray, and I was Miss Bray, and Lucy play herself, and she did that part pretty well. Tuesday morning came, and I overheard Paul talking to Mr. Bray in a concerned voice about Miss Bray's health. And us three girls were told not to come out of the back room. Paul eat and set up a table for us by covering a packing box with an old sheet. And that's where we ate our meals. Lucy said all proper and prim and well-behaved on one end, saying yes ma'am to Mama and no sir to Paul. To my surprise, Mama brought out a plate of cookies a rare treat indeed. But, of course, she passed them out to Mary Liza and Lucy with a smile before sitting mine on the plate without even making eye contact. Mary Liza accepted hers with a thank you while I danced and silently screamed for joy. Lucy was a pretty girl. Her hair was dark brown and waved naturally away from her forehead, making her face oval instead of round. Her gray eyes were clear and large 
and when she wasn't smiling or talking, there was a serious shadow far down on him. She had a dear little mouth, and I'd like to make her laugh so I could see her dimples come out on her cheeks. Her dress was a new material that Mary Liza and I had never seen before. They called the material Old Calico, and by putting my nose to it, I could distinguish an odor that was something like oil. My mother put Lucy on her lap as I nibbled on my cookie, crumb by crumb, trying to make it last longer. Mama, next time you go to town, I wish you'd buy me a dress like that. Don't you think it's pretty? I said. Yes, it's very pretty, Molly. But I don't like you to wear cotton in the winter. I'm afraid you might catch fire. Just then, Mama asked Lucy. Don't you have another dress that you could put on until tomorrow, Lucy? It'd be safer while you children were in this room alone with that fireplace. Lucy was an old-fashioned little body for being the only child for so long and being so much with her mother. Instead of answering directly, she stopped to think, a bucker drawn between her brows with the effect. I don't believe I have, she said slowly. Most all of my clothes are packed up and in the trunks on the wagon. We didn't mean to stay here more than two days, you know, and I don't think it would be worth my time to unpack the trunks. Besides, Mama will be well enough to go to Ohio pretty soon, won't she? I hope so, dear. Mama drew Lucy near and kissed her head. I suppose she was wondering if she'd better go unpack that trunk. Now me, I wasn't glad Miss Bray was sick. Joe's be told. I wasn't in a hurry for her to get well enough to travel. I'd never had another visitor whose easy way of playing suited me as well as Lucy's. She was a year older than me, and a year younger than Mary Lanaza, but she got along beautifully with both of us. And then there was her cat, Alexander the Great, and she was taken to Ohio with her. He was the biggest cat any of us had ever seen, with a coat of the longest, softest fur that you could imagine, all of it pure gray, without a white or black hair on him, and he had lots of fun and sense. Mary Liza wanted at first to make believe that he was a hungry wolf, but Lucy wouldn't hear of it, until I proposed that he should be a tainting wolf that we had taken while he was a baby to defend us. He really seemed to understand what was expected of him, and when we laid down on the feather bed and huddled close together underneath the covers and whispered as the wind screamed around the corner of the house, Alexander would prowl up and down the room and stalk around the bed, never trying to get on it until we asked him to. Then... He would leap into Lucy's arms and purr and tickle her nose with his whiskers until she couldn't speak for laughing. She had had him ever since he was born, and he slept on the foot of her bed each night. While Lucy sat in my mama's lap, he was whining himself in and out between her feet, his tail carried aloft like a soldier's plunging and purring almost as loudly as a watchman's rattle. Mary Liza, give him some milk. Then looking at Lucy, she said, I wish you had a coat like Mary's. Then I wouldn't be so afraid of you taking cold. Mary Liza, tomorrow I want you to see if you have one that'll fit Lucy. Then, with an absent look in her eyes, Mama stared out of the window and said, We must take good care of Lucy while um, this bad weather lasts. And I believe she would have finished that sentence differently, but for the fear of saddening the child, by insinuating that her mother might be sick for a long time. Jealous then, Mama put Lucy down and spoke. Mary Liza, my dear, I trust you to look after these girls. I'll check in on Ewan's in a little while. When she had gone, I went to the window, and I flattened my nose against the glass to peer into the storm. It was a dormer window, and the March snow was drifted high outside. And as I looked out, as if through a tunnel, into the jutting treetops, beyond it was a mad whirl of snowflakes that hid the nearest hills. The wind whined and scolded, and now and then arose into a hoarse bellow. I shivered and slipped my cold hands inside my dress. A shriek of laughter suddenly turned me to the more cheerful scene behind me. Alexander the Great was chasing his own tail as violently as if he had just discovered it and considered it an offense to its dignity. Lucy was clapping her hands to heading on, and Mary Liza was sitting down on a pile of bed and laughing. Before leaving the room, Mama had piled wood on the fire, and a March wind was fighting its way through many a crack and cranny in the walls, and beat at the flames as they flared and danced. Suddenly, the cat dashed dizzily across the hearth, and Lucy, with a cry of alarm, 
darted forward the snatching from the dangerous neighborhood. She called him and pulled him away. But the draft whipped her skirt into the hottest heart of the fire. It was the work of an instant, I tell you. The only dressing of the cotton fabric made it more flammable. I was rooted to the floor in my horror. When I saw a column of flame flash past me towards the door, I jumped up and ran behind Lucy with her piercing wails filling the hallway. Just then, Mama ran into the hallway where I thought she would help Lucy, but instead, she eluded her by keeping close to the wall, letting her pass so she could go check on Mary Liza first. Only then did she rush to Lucy with a blanket to smother the flames. Uh, it was too late. Paul and Mr. Bray spent the entire day engaged in the tragic task of removing Lucy from the hallway, moving her to the shop where they built a coffin for her small body. The details of Lucy's death traumatized me, and my recollection of that first awful scene visited my dreams as if the flames had kenneled upon me and not upon my hapless playmate. I cried myself to sleep that night. My mother, kept awake, doubtless, by the demons of her actions, heard the sobs that I tried to stifle with the bedclothes, and she came to me with talk of a dear savior who had taken sweet little Lucy through his arms and of her happiness and being forever with the Lord. He'd sickened me in the pit of my stomach to listen to the one person that could have saved Lucy, talk of God's will as if he had guided her wicked actions. Just then she spoke. Molly, don't you agree that it was God's will to take Lucy to be with him? I pulled the bed sheet up, only exposing my eyes so that she couldn't see the horror written on my face. Her eyes were void of all emotion, and her tone was absent of any compassion. Her voice sank to a dark rumble. Molly, I ask you a question. But I couldn't answer. I was afraid of her, and I knew that look in her eyes all too well as it was always a precursor to a savage being that she would inflict on me whenever Paul wasn't around. Oh, Molly, you're such a disobedient child. She said as she ran her hand across the side of my face. I was paralyzed with fear as a tear escaped the sound of my eye. Please, Vama, don't hit me. I'll promise. I'll be better. Please. I'll begin to beg with quivering lips. She took her finger, and she caught the tear just as it trickled down my cheek, and she rubbed it against my lips. Just then, a sick and twisted smile spread across her face as her hand was now covering my mouth and pressing my head down into the pillow. She leaned in so close I could feel her hot breath. That's a good girl, Molly. She whispered with her teeth clenched. Because I promise you this, I'll put you where Lucy is if you don't get your shit together. Mama had shown me mercy this time, at least physically. I'd laid there in the dark for hours, in the same room where the tragic events had unfolded. Paul would scrub the floors, but the scorched smell still lingered. It was scarred in many places by fire and smoke, and no amount of scrubbing could quite erase the tracks of the catastrophe. I looked at him for a long time. My state of mind was distinctly morbid, yet Children were not reckoned to have feelings in my house, so little notice was taken of me. All night long, I could hear the shuffling of boots outside my room. The light in the main room burned all night, and shadows walked back and forth of the other side of the door, illuminated by the crack. There were many murmurs and concerned talk as they worked throughout the night. I summoned the courage to place my bare feet on the cold wooden floor, and I tiptoed towards the door and placed my eye against the keyhole. There was my mama, with Miss Bray's tiny baby in her arms, looking down at it, smiling, as she slipped a dress on it. The newborn was quiet, and my curiosity was sparked, when suddenly I saw a new expression wash across my mother's face. It was void and blank, as her eyes lifted upward from the baby, and peered down the hallway towards the keyhole. 
I quickly ran back to bed and covered my head with the sheets until the torment of the sleepless night finally gave way to sunrise. I was finally allowed to leave the back room at breakfast as Mary Lyons and I were eating. Mary Lyons had promptly cleaned her plate as I had apparently poked my fork at the grits and the eggs, but I couldn't eat a single bite. Mr. Bray and Paul sat down to eat. They were both covered in dirt and sawdust, and the solemn expressions on their face bespoke of the entire night of grave gigging. I overheard Mr. Bray tell my mother, we need to have the barrel after breakfast, and that I'm going to leave for Ohio. I can't bear to stay here another night. It appeared to me that the mother and the baby were finally well enough to travel, and I couldn't blame them for wanting to get as far away from this house as possible. Truth be told, if I could have hidden their luggage as a stowaway, I would have gone with them. After breakfast, Mother presented Mary Liza with a spotless, brand new dress and a matching bonnet that she said she'd been saving for a special occasion. You'll want to look your best for Lucy's funeral, now won't you? Mother beamed that's Mary Liza twirled back and forth, modeling the new dress for her. Me? Hmm. <laughs> well, there was no new dress or a bonnet for me, but I knew better than to mention it, even though I had begged her many times for a new one. Molly, don't you think Mary Liza looks beautiful? To my eyes, the dress had been beautiful before my spoiled cousin had put it on. But now, it disgusted me. It made me even sicker. That's what's wrong with you, Molly. You're the most selfish thing I've ever seen. And it embarrasses me to say that you're my daughter. Mary Liza stood there smiling in front of the mirror as I was once again reminded of how worthless I was. Finally, I managed to speak. Well, I was just thinking that I don't even have a bonnet to wear to Lucy's funeral. Oh, don't be silly. Of course you do. There's an old black bonnet hanging on the wall in your pa's shop, and it would be a perfect fit for you. Go fetch it and wash it up. Now, I'd always been scared to go in pa's shop, and knowing that they had just finished building Lucy's coffin in there the night before deeply disturbed me. I pushed hard against the door but it was stuck in the frame, and I was fearing that it might be locked, when suddenly it gave way and almost fell to the floor. It was a dreary place. Although the sunshine poured broadly from wall to wall, a smoky smell filled the room. There I saw the charred remains of Lucy's clothes from the fire that had brought such woe, and they were now cold in the corners of the hearth, having toppled head foremost and backward, and were burned through to the metal. The old burned blanket was also there, just as my mother had left them. A ball that Alexander the Great had enchased was also laying there. It was like a blast of icy air, like I had only just seen them on fire with my own eyes just a few minutes before. A strange and unfamiliar tremor that I'd even recognize a superstitious dread contracted my heart, and I stopped frozen in my tracks. Just within the doorway, I took in every feature of the haunted room before I rushed over to the wall where the bonnets hung, and I climbed a chair, and I grabbed the black bonnet and a black apron from another peg, and I jerked it down and ran off shakingly. The intense trembling had gotten into my legs, and I had to steady myself against the wall even after I took safe shelter of the garden fence. My heart was beating so loudly that I had to pull myself together before putting on my apron in the bonnet, and just then I reawakened from the nightmare to the business of the hour. Mama and Mary Liza met me at the porch. The moment to bid farewell to Lucy was at hand. Is Miss Bray coming? I asked. Yes, she's already there with your paw and Mr. Bray. Now hurry up. We don't want to keep them waiting. I walked directly behind Mother and Mary Liza through the old orchard, out through the drawbars at the lower end, and into the graveyard beyond. It was a retired, but not unlovely spot. A brick wall enclosed six generations of my ancestors and their next of kin, with a locked gate to keep out trespassers. Lone streamers of briar and wild berry bushes, purple and ashy, with the mantling sap drawn upward by the sun, were matted over the older graves. A spreading of honeysuckle arose near the middle of the badly kept square, and smaller trees flourished here and there. An apple tree leaned over the wall. As we entered the old gate, it let out a creaking sound that sent shivers down my spine. 
I had once dared to open it before, while playing at the old orchard, but I couldn't summon the courage to enter the forbidden ground. And now, all three of us walked towards the top of the hill through rows of time-worn stones with long-forgotten names etched upon them, mingled with graves that were simply marked with rocks. Up ahead, I saw the two men waiting on us to arrive, standing at the top of the hill. Yet, it was impossible for my heart to be prepared for what I saw next. The mound of fresh black soil was incredibly tall as I walked around it. My eyes beheld not one, but three open graves containing the caskets of Lucy, the newborn baby, and this spray. Inside each pit was a newly constructed casket. The smell of earth and milled lumber filled the air. The baby's coffin was little more than a small box. The five of us stood, looking down into the graves. My eyes instinctively looked up at Mr. Bray. His face was a study in gray. Just two days before, it was full of ambition and hope as his family set out to settle into the unknown state of Ohio. And now, he had lost everything in the world that he loved, all at once, and his face was just as hardened as the rows of headstones that surrounded us. Paul called for the ceremony to start, and he pulled a folded piece of paper from his shirt pocket, where he had hastily penciled in some words in preparation for this moment. I am the resurrection and a life, saith the Lord. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believes in me shall never die. Then he folded the paper back, and everyone bowed their heads and closed their eyes to pray. Except me, I looked around and then down into the dark holes in the ground. My thoughts drifted back to what I had saw through that keyhole last night when I saw my mother dressing the newborn. Had the baby already perished by that point, or had my mother helped that baby just like she helped Lucy? The thought mortified me, but I knew firsthand how violent she could be. Just then, I heard a sound, a crying sound. At first, I thought it was coming from the baby's spots. Before I realized, Alexander the Great had appeared next to me, and his soft cries mourned the loss of Lucy. I still hadn't digested this morbid scene when both Mr. Bray and Paul picked up their shovels and stuck them into the flinty black soil. I began tossing them on top of the graves. I stood frozen when my mother pulled my arm. It's time to go, Molly. That's it? I asked. That's all there is? And now they're just gone? That's all there is? They're with Jesus now, rejoicing in heaven. You should be happy for them. She replied as we neared the gate of the cemetery, with the sounds of the shovel still echoing. Just then, something slipped from my mouth before I could catch the words. They escaped. I don't believe that. Lucy shouldn't have died, and you could have saved her. In an instant, Mother spun around and slapped me as hard as she could. I fell to the ground, crashing into an old tombstone, toppling it over, and she walked slowly towards me with fire in her eyes. And she stepped on the falling stone and she leaned over, taking a handful of my hair, clenching it tightly in her fist. There's plenty of room for one more grave, Molly. Paul had left with Mr. Bray to accompany the heartbroken man on his journey to Ohio, and he wouldn't be back for the next three weeks. No sooner than he left, Mother grounded me to my room. Lunch came and went. I wasn't fed. But she had done this to me so many times that I always secretly kept crackers underneath my mattress. I shared the secret ration with Alexander the Great. At least I had him, and I could tell why Lucy loved him so much. Before long, I heard the voice of my cousin, Maggie Bale. She had come over to take me to her house for the day, but... Mother sent Mary Liza and Bud instead. I was only let out of my room once, that entire day, to fill the kitchen water bucket from the well. The rest of the day, I sat in my room, watching the sun cast shadows across the wall. The room was cold. The fireplace hadn't been lit since a tragedy, and we only had one heat source in the house, and that was a kerosene heater in the main room. Still, I did my best not to make a sound and draw any attention to myself. 
I can honestly say I was terrified of my mother, and I kept hearing sounds of the shovel and the graveyard and echoes of her hateful words echoing through my ears. And just as the sun set, I was finally allowed to come out of the room and go to the bathroom and eat supper. I sat on one end of the table, opposite side of my mother, too scared to even open my mouth. It was just us two. Mary Liza wouldn't be home until tomorrow, and Paul was traveling by wagon and was probably more than 30 miles away by now. To me, this was the most dangerous position I could be in with my mother. In the presence of others, she was a master manipulator and tormented me with psychological abuse. But when we were alone, things would happen to me that I could never speak of again, not even to my imaginary friends. And there I was again. I was Daniel, and this was the lion's den, and I knew full well that the lions were bloodthirsty. After my comment back at the graveyard, she stared at me from across the table. After all I've done for you, Molly, you never learn, do you? Well, you're going to learn tonight. Usually, she would hit me with a switch from the weeping willow tree, all over my legs and my back, leaving whelps that would remain for weeks after the beating, but not tonight. I saw that she had a leather strap that she had taken from the bridle of her horse. I could see it wrapped around her fist. Surely, this would be the night that the lions ate Daniel, and he would perish and be buried long before Paul ever returned. I knew Daniel would have to fight this time, and he would fight with everything that was in him. Suddenly, she flew up from the table and ran at me screaming. The first lash hit me across my arm, which I held up in futile defense from the attack. And at the same time, I threw my supper plate and hit her in the face. But the blows continued, and it came swiftly, twice more. The strap ripped across my stomach and my chest, tearing through my dress, before I crashed backwards in my chair to the floor, knocking the kerosene heater over. A river of fire poured towards her as I scrambled backwards, trying to get out of her reach. In an instant, her dress was on fire, and she screamed my name for help. The water bucket was right next to me, and I quickly grabbed it. But then, something stopped me from picking it up. I honestly tried to pick it up, but I couldn't. Some invisible force poured my hands from the handle. Instead, I took off running out of the lion's den, completely traumatized. And in that moment, Molly was beyond the possibility of all reconstruction. Thank you.